So at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I interviewed one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, a man named Professor Earl Miller. He said to me, look, you've got to understand one crucial thing about the human brain. You can only think consciously about one thing at a time. And this is just a fundamental limit of the human brain. It's been there for 40,000 years in that way. Um, the human brain hasn't changed in 40,000 years significantly. Um, it ain't going to change anytime soon. You have this limit. You can think about one thing at a time. But what's happened is we've begun to tell ourselves a story that we can actually do many, many things at the same time. We've told ourselves, in fact, a guy called Larry Rosen, a professor, discovered the average young person believes they can follow seven forms of media at the same time. But what happens when you believe you're doing many things at the same time, you're actually juggling, you're switching very rapidly between things. And that comes with a series of really big costs. So the Johan, thank you very, very much for coming on. How are you? Oh, cheers, Fergus. I'm, I'm good. I, I was just saying to you before we went live that I'm very jealous of your facial hair that you have at the moment because when I try to grow facial hair, it looks like a child has drawn on my face. It's very unfortunate. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy but envious is how I... What I didn't tell you is that I have had a child draw this on my face this morning. It's just very, very well done. <laughs> but uh, no, very, very pleased to, to have you on. i child to my house. <laughs> <laughs> very, very pleased to have you on as it's... It's a, it's a it's a personal one for me actually. It, it, I've I've had a lot of really exciting and important people on this podcast, and for that I'm very grateful. But from a personal point of view, this is the one that sort of means most to me, and almost feels like I'm talking to a celebrity in my book because you've had such an influence on me in terms of understanding my own depression, unpacking the human elements of it, and ultimately underpinning the narrative that I like to put across now, which is that we are depressed and anxious because of a lack of fulfillment, a lack of purpose, a lack of understanding of what makes us tick, a focus on the wrong things, the externals, the junk values, all the things you talk about. And Lost Connections for me was the most liberating book that I've ever read. So for anyone that hasn't read it, I would 100% encourage you to, you know, I'm going to be very anti-podcast marketing focused here and tell you to pause this and go and, go and listen to Lost Connections instead. But yeah. from me to you, I'm just very thankful for you providing that perspective for me to understand. But the first question really is what what led you to to writing lost connections and, and that and going on that journey yourself um i'm really moved by what you just said and you should be really proud of yourself for the work you're doing now and and the way that you've come through the pain that you that you that you were going through um for me i, I wrote lost connections because there were these two mysteries that i wanted to understand every book i ever write there's a question that I want to know the answer to, that I don't know the answer to. And, you know, obviously I have some ideas. I have, you know, I'm not a completely blank slate when I start. So for my first book, Chasing the Scream, we'd had a lot of addiction in my family. I wanted to understand what causes addiction, what solves addiction, why we seem to be responding so badly to addiction. What's going on? Um, for my most recent book, Stolen Focus, I wanted to understand why so many people are struggling to focus and pay attention. Um... And, and what's going on, I actually discovered that I think we're really profoundly misunderstanding what's happening to us. We feel like our attention has collapsed. Actually, it's been stolen from us, and it's been stolen from us by some really big forces that we're going to have to take on and defeat to get our brains back. Um, but for Lost Connections, there were, it was really there were these two, two mysteries. The first is, I'm, I'm now 42, and... Every year that I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased in Britain, the US, and in fact, across almost all of the Western world. And I wanted to understand, well, why, right? Why is this happening to us? Why is it that with each year that passes, more and more of us are finding it harder to get through the day? Um, and I wanted to understand that for a more personal reason, which is that when I was a teenager, I, had, I remember going to my doctor and explaining that I had this feeling like pain was leaking out of me. And I couldn't control it. I couldn't regulate it. I was quite ashamed of it. And my doctor told me this story that I now realise was well-intentioned, but really oversimplified. My doctor said, well, we know why some people get like this. They just have a problem in their brain. All you need to do is take some drugs and you're going to be fine. So I started taking antidepressant. It gave me some relief, but I ultimately remained depressed. Um, and so I wanted to figure out well, what's going on here, because I'm doing everything that I'm told to do according to the story we tell in our culture that depression is just a problem in your brain and I'm still depressed and there seem to be a lot of people around me in the same position. What's going on here? Um, and so that's when I went on this big journey all over the world. I interviewed the leading experts about what causes depression and anxiety and what solves them. I'm just going to turn the heat off. Sorry. Um, what, 
and and um, I learned that that there's actually scientific evidence for nine different causes of depression and anxiety. Two of them are in our biology. That's why my doctor wasn't totally wrong. But most of the factors that cause depression and anxiety are factors in the way we live. And I think it's interesting. This has become very clear to people in the last two years, right? Obviously, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. It's changed the way all of us live and all of our expectations. And the health secretary in Britain, Sajid Javid, just said the other day that based, he's been advised by the NHS that depression and anxiety have doubled since this pandemic began. Now, it is not... What happened in the last two years is not that all of our brains spontaneously started to malfunction at the same time, right? That's obviously not what happened. What happened is all sorts of factors that have been proven to cause depression and anxiety, like loneliness, financial insecurity, have massively increased. And that is what's caused this depression and anxiety epidemic. I think that's very obvious to everyone, right? It's, I think it's helped us to see we need to have a much deeper and more nuanced understanding of depression and anxiety, which is one reason why the NHS has changed just in the last two days, it's, uh, last sorry, two weeks, has changed its official advice on how we should be responding to depression and anxiety in line with the things I was saying in Lost Connections. That's not because of me, but it's because they're responding to the same scientific evidence that I was trying to explain to people in, in that book. It's very fascinating that you've... You've preempted the the realization and the epiphany that society's come to in many ways because for so long the narrative was depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain, which it can be. And as you've said, we didn't all collectively malfunction at the same time. We were all suddenly under insurmountable amounts of pressure that none of us saw coming. And what's that going to do? It's going to force us to reconsider how we live our lives. It's going to force us to reconsider who we spend our time with, what we're doing for a living. All these things that are fundamental components of the, the nine sort of fundamental reasons why we can be depressed in, in lost connections. And I, I think that the question for me is, why do you think pre-pandemic the society has become so disconnected? And then the, the second element to that is, what of the ne which of the negative habits of the, of the pandemic have, have carried through, which is making this problem worse than it was before? So I think there's a lot, but let's focus on one in particular. So before the pandemic hit we were the loneliest society in human history in the western world there's a study that asks americans how many close friends do you have who you could turn to in a crisis and when they started doing it years ago the most common answer was five today the most common answer is none right um there's 41 percent of americans agree with the statement nobody knows me well what what is life like if nobody knows you well i spent a lot of time discussing this and that was before the pandemic obviously then the pandemic hit and we had to separate because to prevent the spread of an airborne virus and I remember I spent a lot of time interviewing a man named Professor John Cassiopo who was at the University of Chicago who was the leading expert on loneliness in the world and it sadly subsequently died and um, he made a huge series of breakthroughs firstly he, he proved that, that loneliness has massively increased and secondly he proved that loneliness causes depression. I know that might sound like a bit of a no shit Sherlock <laughs> discovery, but until then it was thought that depression caused loneliness. You got depressed and that made you lonely. And of course that does happen sometimes, but he also proved the causation goes the other way. Loneliness more often causes depression. And I remember him saying to me one day, you know, why do we exist, right? You, me, everyone listening, why are we here? One key reason is that our ancestors in the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. A lot of the time they weren't bigger than the animals they took down or faster than the animals they took down, but they were much better at banding together into groups and cooperating, right? Just like bees evolved to live in a hive, humans evolved to live in a tribe. And we are the first humans ever to disband our tribes. And that happened long before COVID made it necessary for us to have a period of social distancing. Um, and, and this is a key, it's one of the nine key reasons what, that cause depression and anxiety, and it's one of the ones that's been absolutely exploding, right? And I think it's partly, there's, there's a big debate about why did loneliness increase so much, and I think there's a, a big debate about that, and it's, the truth is we don't really know, although there's many factors clearly that have played some role. I think one is, we've started to tell ourselves very extreme individualistic stories about who we are and what we should be that no previous human society ever told right we think about even when we try to cheer each other up like if someone's depressed often people 
we'll, we'll, we'll say to them on Facebook or whatever, nobody can help you but you, right? Things like that, these, these kind of weird little cliches we set, which is completely wrong, right? Actually, lots of people can help you but you. In fact, we all need people to help us other than us. But this kind of belief that you've got to do it yourself, that, 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 that a successful person is a self-determining individual, right? No human has ever been a self-determining individual. If you, were, you, know, if you tried to be a self-determining individual, you would just die, right? The, the, um, you, you are entirely dependent on other people the whole time. None of us grow our own food. We don't, you know, you didn't raise yourself from babyhood. You didn't, you didn't teach yourself the language we're now speaking in. It's a crazy way of thinking, and it promotes, of course, some individualism is healthy, right? We don't want to become like the Amish or whatever, who are entirely collective. Uh, we want to have some individuality. We don't want to be like the Soviet Union, which is a fucking horrifying nightmare of, of collectivism. Some individualism is healthy, but extreme individualism, which is what we have, just produces all sorts of pathologies. And one of them is it just makes people... It, it gives you the wrong map to guide yourself through life, right? Um, and it trains you to, to, to look for happiness in all the wrong places, to not seek help when you... when just in ordinary pain, you know. Um, so I think that's one reason. There's lots of reasons, but that's um, that, that's one of them. It shines really true for me because you, you've almost succinctly summarised the critical components of what led me to be more and more depressed over time because I, I left school with a very clear roadmap for the rest of my life based on the societal parameters that I felt I could work within and therefore what I could best give as a self-driven individual to and within those parameters. So the mm. second I deviated from that path, I felt like I was doing less than I could be, like I was failing. And then if I deviated more, I was failing more. And then the second I started failing more, I became useless. And if I became useless, what was the point in existing? If I couldn't contribute to these these self-driven goals and I couldn't look after myself and keep moving forwards, regression to me was as good as as good as failure and failure was as good as pointlessness and pointlessness pointlessness led me to the conclusion that I'd rather be dead. So that, that's just a very harsh example of how those preconceived ideas of individuality can only operate within preconceived boundaries is completely false. And that in fact, individuality is something that is fantastic. We should all embrace our weirdness. We should all embrace our quirks because nobody is better at being the individual version of ourselves than we are. And that's a beautiful thing. So the disconnect the disconnection i think people have learned a lot about themselves through the pandemic that can somewhat mitigate a lot of the reasons why we already were the loneliest society in the world prior to that but i think the the bigger issue as well is that we are you've said yourself and there's one of the things i learned from you directly was that we're working from a broken formula of happiness aren't we and the study that you re referenced that i've gone back and looked into myself is the one from dr brett ford and how exploring what happiness means to different societies and how that actually manifests itself in society has taught us so much about how we should be living our lives. So would you mind just giving a bit of an insight on why you chose to explore that study and, and manifest it into the book in the first place? Yeah, this was a moment that was really revelatory to me. Um, I went to interview Dr. Brett Ford. She was at Berkeley at the time. That um, She's actually in Toronto, University of Toronto now, I think. So she was part of this really big study. It was done by a huge number of scientists, not just her, she would, she would stress. Um, so what they did is they wanted to look into something very simple. Let's imagine that you decided you were going to spend an hour a day trying to make yourself happier. They wanted to find out, does it work? Would you actually become happier? And they did this research in four countries, the United States, Russia, Taiwan and Japan. And what they discovered at first seems really weird in the United States, I'm pretty sure this would be true in Britain as well. In the United States, if you try to make yourself happier deliberately, it doesn't work. But in the other countries, Russia, Taiwan and Japan, if you try to make yourself happier deliberately, you do become happier. And they were like, that's really weird. Why would that be? And they went back and did more analysis. What they discovered was in the United States, if you try to make yourself happier, in the main, you do something for yourself. You know, you try to get a promotion, you work harder, you buy stuff to display it on social media to make people jealous, whatever it might be. You, you, you do something for you, right? In the other countries, in the main, of course there were exceptions on both sides, but in the main, in the other countries, when you consciously try to make yourself happier, you did something for someone else. Your friends, your family, your community. So we have an instinctively individualistic idea of what it means to be happy. You want to be happier, you do something for you. 
they have an instinctively collective idea of what it means to be happier. You want to be happier, do something for us, do something for the group, right? And it turns out our story of happiness just, just doesn't work, right? It just doesn't work very well. We're not that species, right? There's this, like, Winston Churchill once said, communism's a great theory. Um, they just got the wrong species. It works very well for ants. And in a similar way, I think individualism is a nice theory, but we're not that species. It just doesn't work, right? A species of, individualist, of individualists would have died out on the savannas of Africa, right? They, they, they wouldn't have been able to band together, form a group and survive. That's not who we are. So um, I think that's one of many ways in which we've, we, we've got the wrong story about how to make ourselves happy. So we do, I think it's why a lot of people get into the situation where they, they, they feel like, but I'm doing all the things you're meant to do, right? And I don't feel good. There must be something really wrong with me. And the problem isn't with you. The problem is with the, with the story of what you're meant to do, right? Similarly, a guy called Professor Tim Kasser discovered, who's an amazing man at, Professor, uh, at Knox College in Illinois, who, who discovered that, um, the, I mean, this is how I would paraphrase it, but, you know, just like junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, a kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. We've been trained to think that the way you make yourself feel happy is to seek money and status and external markers of success like lots of hearts on Instagram. That is not where you find happiness. And actually, he, he proved that the more you think happiness it should be measured is measured by money, status, these external markers, the more unhappy, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious. And the more you seek happiness through um, intrinsic sources of meaning is the, the kind of fancy phrase. So things that are actually meaningful about connecting with other people, about connecting with purpose, meaning, connection, um, the, the less likely you are to become depressed and anxious. So, so it's like we, you know, it, it's like we've been fed a kind of KFC for the soul, right? We've, we've, we've been trained to... To, to look for happiness in all the wrong places. And we don't have to do that, right? We can change our value system. People uh, look for answers in the modern world, don't they? And I know you can't give them, and I know this is, is somewhat a uh, open-ended question, but this this leads quite nicely into into the next stage of your, your journey as an author and, and how we want to focus more on what should we be focusing on. How do people find their intrinsic values and what's meaningful to them because we're, we are operating within the story that is being told to us so to recreate your own story your own value system is obviously a difficult thing to do but what practices have you found through your research through your own experiences that have helped others better determine what keeps them ticking over intrinsically so they can focus less on the external stuff that's filling their head with those junk values the kfc diet for the soul how do we how do we find a poke bowl for the soul I think is the is the real question here. <laughs> I feel slightly fraudulent because I would always choose a KFC over a <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, the So it's a really important question. And I think the first thing to say is it's extremely hard to do it as an isolated individual. And it's much easier to do by building and finding groups. And there's um, Professor Kasser who, who made this breakthrough. was part of a really key experiment that showed this. It's a very practical thing. I really recommend everyone listening does. I do it with a group of my friends. So it originated with a guy called Nathan Dungan. Nathan is a financial advisor in Minneapolis, and he um, he got a call. He, he advises people on household budgets, basically. And he got a call um, from a high school. I think it was a middle school, actually, in in uh, Minneapolis. And they said, look, we've got a problem. We need you to help us. The kids at the school were getting obsessed with getting the latest Nike sneakers, the latest iPhone, whatever it might be. And often their parents couldn't afford it. And the kids were just going crazy when they couldn't get it. And it was really causing a lot of problems. So he, the school said, well, you just come in and teach the kids about household budgeting. So he comes in, he gives them lessons about household budgeting and quickly realizes they don't give a shit about household budgeting. Right? They're just like, yeah, whatever. I need this iPhone, right? Uh, so he, he decided, he teamed up with Professor Kasser and he did this really interesting experiment. It's quite simple. He got the parents and the kids to come in uh, once every couple of weeks for quite a long time. I think it was four months. 
And they came in in groups. So the parents and kids would sit together in groups with other parents and kids. And the first time they met, they just said, um, make a list of everything you've got to have. And they did not define what that meant. Just everything you've got to have. So, of course, everyone at first puts food, water, shelter, that kind of thing. But quite quickly, people started listing things you haven't got to have, like the latest iPhone. The parents would often list things that you didn't have to have either. And then they'd say to them, OK, they'd get to that bit of the list and they'd say, OK, talk me through how your life would be different if you got this thing that you're craving. So let's say Nike sneakers. Nobody said, oh, I want the Nike sneakers because I'm a basketball player and I want to be able to jump higher. Right? No one said that. No one said, I want the new iPhone because I'm a professional photographer and it's got this amazing new way of taking pictures. Right? No one said that. They said things like, well, if I got that, people would envy me. Or if I got that, people would want, to be part, would want me to be part of their group. It doesn't take long to get people to say that out loud. We go like, hmm, what? So, so what's happening here is you feel lonely, right? You, you, you don't feel part of a group. Why do you think getting a little blue tick on your on a piece of plastic would would mean you deserve to be part of a group? It doesn't take long for people to realise that these are ideas that are implanted in our head by advertising to, to deal with something deeper that's going on. But the most interesting bit of this experiment was what happened next. Then they said to people, just write down a moment in your life when you've had a feeling of meaning and purpose. And again, they didn't define that, right? They just said, just think about a moment in your life when you've really felt you were in it, you were doing the right thing, you know, something good was happening to you. And again, people made different, people named different things. For me, it would probably be moments when I was writing or related to my work or moments in my personal life. Um, some people, it was playing the guitar. Some people, it was when they were a nurse and they'd help someone. You know, you can, we can all think, and I would urge people listening to just stop for a second and think about a moment in your life. And then they said... Okay, how could you build more of your life around pursuing these moments of meaning and purpose and less around pursuing, you know, buying shit you don't need to make people jealous, right? And, and they just kept coming back and just checking in with each other and having these conversations. We don't really have these conversations very often in our culture. Um, and what they discovered was just checking in once every few weeks for months... And having these conversations led to a really measurable change in people's values. They measured the values at the beginning and the end, which we know correlates with lower depression and anxiety. So after I learned this, what I do, we, we used to do it in the flesh every month, but um, partly because I've been out of the country and obviously because of the plague. Um, and me and a group of my friends, the first of every month, we just have a Zoom where we, we, we talk about, oh, what are the times in the last month when we've done something meaningful what were the times when we felt ourselves being diverted onto bullshit, you know, and that happens to all of us. And that's both because that's a part of human nature and because we live in a machine that is m built to maximise the bullshit, right? Um, and, and we just have those conversations and it's there's something very centering about having those conversations. Like I've got a book, you know, that's about to come out as we're having this conversation. And there's two ways I can think about that, right? I can think about, okay, why does this book matter? It matters because I think we are having a deep attention crisis in our society. You know, the average American college student now focuses on any one task for 65 seconds and the average office worker now focuses on any one task for three minutes. That's really important. If you have a life where you can't pay attention, that life will be diminished in all sorts of ways. You won't be able to achieve your goals. If we have a society full of people who can't pay attention, we won't be able to solve problems together as a society. We'll, we'll face all sorts of bigger problems. That really matters. And, OK, I spent three years travelling all over the world, interviewing the leading experts on attention, and I think I learned loads of really important things about, about why attention matters, how you can get attention, uh, what causes attention to degenerate. When I think about those things, the meaning of the book, I feel quite calm, I feel quite good. You know, I think, oh, OK... That, that matters. That was that was work worth doing, right? But there's another bit of me that goes into the mode of, well, will people buy the book? Will it sell? What will people say about the book? Will you know? Will uh, will people slag it off on social media? Will famous people praise it? Well, I can go into this spiral of, and all that stuff makes me really anxious because that's the junk values, right? Um, that's the 
that's the ego stuff, right? That, that, that doesn't, doesn't matter. That's not what's important. What's important is the meaning of what I said and my belief that if we communicate that meaning to people, their lives will be better, right? We can make our lives better. So we're all, whatever's happening in your life, there's always a dialogue between these different parts of you, right? That none of us is, you know, I mean, maybe very extreme, someone like Donald Trump is almost 100% the external markers and maybe a very other extreme, there's a handful of saints who are entirely, but the rest of us, are, we all live on a spectrum, right? And we move about that spectrum at different points in our lives. Um, so the more you can centre yourself on meaning, and purpose the less likely you are to be depressed and anxious the better it is to pay easier it is to pay attention there's lots of evidence that the more something is meaningful to you the better you can focus there's a whole range of of things that flow from meaning but meaning is much easier to build in groups if you're just an isolated individual being fucking bombarded by a machinery telling you you know buy this shampoo because you're worth it right or whatever, no disrespect to shampoo, which I, I use as well, um, the, the, that's very hard to resist on your own. But as groups, it's, it's, it, you know, there are ways we can resist it. There's, there's so many things in there that just sort of hit home for me in many ways because I, I've noticed a real, a real profound change in my group of friends, sort of pre-pandemic that's really been developed throughout it. And we're still, a lot of us have been driven externally for years, I think it's fair to say, they won't mind me saying that. But now the conversations when we do rarely and without restrictions sometimes manage to meet up, there are much more meaningful beneath the surface conversations around what are you doing at your work that is actually making you enjoy it? How are you spending your time and what are the new things that you're doing that are giving your life more meaning? Is your relationship as you hoped it would be and still moving in the right direction for these reasons and there's no barrier between us anymore and I think that that comes part and parcel of the fact that sharing my story with them all gave them that honesty to speak to me about it in reverse but now that collective honesty has opened it up in many ways so to your point on finding meaning as a group I've got first-hand experience of that and know how valuable that can be so from a practical point of view for those listening your calibration point on the first of every month makes perfect sense but that doesn't need to be a zoom it that i mean for many ways in the western world that is what meeting up with your mates in the pub and having a sort of breakdown conversation has been for years gone by but there's there's ways that can obviously be abused ways that can be a negative habit but the premise is the same whether it's around a golf if you're later in later in life whether it's playing rugby at the weekend it's all these things it's coming together and doing something that distracts you from the white noise to actually figure out what what happens next i think is very important but with your new book what I was very surprised by was how much more it informed my understanding of what is actually meaningful for me mm. than it just did help me think about how better to focus. So what I mean by that is Lost Connections for me helped me understand the experience I'd had, the mistakes that I'd made, the ways in which I should monitor my own spectrum of mental health from healthy to unhealthy, and then Stolen Focus has helped me understand how I should structure my day, how I should structure my existence, my week to make sure that I'm doing things at the right level of application with the right level of priority, with the right environment to do them in. And I think the journey you went on is that <laughs> takes a lot of a lot of guts to pack up and, and, and go and do. But for you, what was the what was the Volta moment, the epiphany moment that made you decide I need to go and do this and write the book in this way? Because I'll allow you to explain how the how the book begins. But the book begins with almost a, a, a semi, a, a non, a non-theistic spiritual journey. I'd say. Well, that's such an interesting way of putting it. I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but I think that's true. I, you know, it's something I've been thinking about for a long time. Right? I, I, it seemed to me that people, of course, I wasn't sure if it was the case because you can never judge from your own anecdotal experience. But it seemed to me like attention was getting worse. Um, but I wasn't sure. And I think I was a bit worried about looking into it with all the questions I asked for my books. I'm always a bit wary of looking into it as well, because usually you think, oh, what will I find? Will I find something ugly about myself, right? And there was this moment when I thought, no, I have to do this. So when he was nine, my godson, I've changed a couple of the details of him to, identi to not identify him, but when he was nine, my godson, Adam, um, developed I never quite understood why but he developed this brief but really freakishly intense obsession with Elvis 
So he would like run around the house singing Viva Las Vegas and Blue Moon. And, and he didn't know that that style, Elvis's style, had become like this kind of cheesy cliche. So he did it in this really heart-catchingly sincere way. And, uh, and he kept demanding that I tell him this, the story of Elvis's life. And I'm like, oh shit, well, what, what will I say about the ending? So, uh, you know, I would tell him the story about how Elvis was born in a town called Tupelo in, Miss in Mississippi, which is a very poor town. And, and he, was, he, he was born, um, his, his identical twin brother actually died at birth. And how when he was a little boy, his mother told him that if he sang at the moon, um, his brother could hear him. And that's why he started singing all the time. Anyway, I kind of whizzed through a lot of the rest of the story. Uh, I told him about how he built, Elvis built a palace for his mother and called it Graceland. And, um, and then one night when I was tucking him in, he, um, he said to me, Oh, Johan, will you, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, yeah, sure, in the way that you do with, with children when they ask you ridiculous things. I said, of course I will. Uh, and he said, do you, pro do you really promise we'll really go to Graceland one day? And I'm like, yeah, I promise you. Anyway, I never thought about it again until 10 years later when lots of things had really gone wrong. So Adam was 19. He dropped out of school when he was 15. Um, and he, he, it was like something had really fractured in him. And in that decade, a lot of fracturing was happening to a lot of people. So he would, he just seemed to be spending all his time alternating between his three devices. He had a laptop, he had a phone and he had an iPad. And he seemed to live in this sort of blur of WhatsApp and YouTube and porn. And, uh, it, it, and it was like his mind was sort of whirring at the speed of Snapchat. It was like nothing could gain any traction in his head. Um, and like I say, he was the extreme end of the spectrum, but it felt like we'd all moved closer in that decade to, the, to that part of the spectrum, right? And then one day I was sitting on my sofa with him and he was just going from one device to another and I was trying to talk to him and he was just very fractured. And, and, and I was looking at my own phone and feeling pissed off at myself and I said, you know, Adam, let's go to Graceland. And he said, what do you mean? And he, he didn't even remember this Elvis obsession he'd had, right? And I reminded him and he said, and I said, no, no, let's go. Let's just go. We've got to break this numbing routine. Let's go to Graceland. And he said, are you serious? And I said, yeah, but you, we'll go to the south. And I took him to lots of places in the south, but we'll go on one condition, which is that you, when we're there, you leave your phone in the hotel because I can't take you around if you're going to be just on your phone the whole time. You know, we may as well just stay at home. And he promised. So quite quickly after that, I think it was literally two weeks after that, we took off from Heathrow. We went to New Orleans first. But when you arrive at the gates of Graceland now, there isn't a physical guide to show you around. This was even pre-COVID. What they do is they give you an iPad and you put headphones in and the iPad guides you around. So it says go left, go right. And there's a representation of whatever you're looking at on the iPad. And it, as, the, as an actor narrates the story to you. So what that means is everyone walks around Graceland just staring at an iPad, right? Um, and, and, and we're walking around at, surrounded by this sort of blank faced army of like Canadians and Koreans and, and I'm sort of looking at them and I'm finding this quite funny and, and sort of annoying but funny and I, I keep trying to make eye contact with other people to sort of go, oh hey, we're the two people who travelled 3,000 miles and actually looked at the thing we came to see, right? And there was one point where someone did make eye contact with me and I was about to smile and say something. And then I realised he had only taken out his headphones and looked away from the iPad so he could take out his phone and take a selfie. I was like, oh, okay. And anyway, we carry on walking around and we eventually get to the jungle room, which was Elvis's favourite room in the, in the jungle. In the, sorry, in the mansion. It's um, yeah, a big fake jungle. And there's this couple standing next to me and the guy turns to his wife and he says... Honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And so she starts looking at her iPad and swiping. And I, and I look at them and I just said, but sir, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. You could just turn your head because we are actually in the jungle room, right? You don't have to look at a representation of it, a digital representation of it. We're actually here. Do you understand? We're, we're in the jungle room. Right? And they understandably looked at me like I was a, a lunatic and just left the room. 
and and I turned to to my godson to sort of say, God, did you see that? And laugh with him. But he was just standing in a corner looking at Snapchat because the whole time, I remember the moment we landed in New Orleans, he turned on his phone and I said, oh, but you, this is the very thing you said you wouldn't do. And he said, oh, I meant I wouldn't take phone calls. I can't not use Snapchat. And he looked, at, he said that with kind of baffled honesty as if, as if I'd said, well, you, you were going to breathe, you're going to hold your breath for the next three weeks, aren't you? Um, so I, I, I in, in the jungle room, I really got angry and I sort of said, you know, you're so frightened of missing out. You've got this fear of missing out, but you're guaranteeing you'll miss out, right? You're, you're going through life not being present at any of the things you're experiencing. You're constantly distancing yourself from reality. This is no way to live. And he stormed off again, understandably. So I spent the rest of the day wandering around Graceland on my own and, and I found him that night. We were staying at the Heartbreak Hotel, which is sort of up the street from Graceland. And I found him sitting by the swimming pool, which is in the shape of a giant guitar. And there's the, they, they play Suspicious Minds in a constant loop there. And, and I remember just looking at his phone and just saying, look, I know something is really wrong, but I don't know what it is. And that was the moment when I thought, OK, I need to find out what's going wrong. And I think what must have empowered that to some degree is you have seen and witnessed in, in Adam the, the focus was once there. It was once always applied to the obsession with Elvis and I've often felt like this myself in the past couple of years because when it came to my exams my levels I was just in this completely obsessive state of having a bit of a taste of a tangible outcome for hard work I just got obsessed with that do more work reap more reward and the way I structured my life the way I structured my day the way I structured my weekends the way I structured my work schedule was unfathomable to me when I like entered the working world because I was like how did I how did I apply myself in that way? But that's because I was extrinsically motivated by the facade that doing a degree at Oxford could give me for the rest of my life. So I, I managed to internalize that as this is what I want to be doing and then practice that in my day-to-day -day life through focus. And then since then, up until recently, I've had no concept of how I was ever that person that was that focused. Mm. But then the chapter on flow states is really where I started to, not that I wasn't paying attention, but where I really start to switch on and think, oh, there's, one, I was a bit proud of myself because I already have this implemented into my week by week, day by day, because my flow states are my low intensity endurance training. So Saturdays for me for the past three years have been, it, it's it's ingrained into me where somebody asks what you what you do on a Friday night. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm preparing for my Saturday long bike ride, not knowing that they obviously don't know that because nobody else cares. But for me, it's Saturdays have been long runs in the hills, long runs on my feet, on tarmac, long bike rides, long swims, whatever it's been. And for me, because I'm moving at a pace that's challenging enough to sort of shut off the external white noise, it allows me to just calibrate on the actual real intrinsic workings of my brain. So every single week I get four to six to eight hours of unadulterated, undistracting, without headphones, flow state time to just reflect recalibrate and go again week by week by week but I only recently reflected on it and through the through reading that chapter made me realize actually I have found that focus that I once had to exams there's a whole separate podcast on the flaws of the education system I'm sure but the way in which I applied myself to those I now apply myself to what I actually enjoy doing now and I'm very lucky and fortunate to be able to do things that I enjoy on a day-by-day -day basis but finding flow states is obviously a big clue that you're doing something that is intrinsically valuable for you so i think the the way that you found yours was to head off to provincetown basically shut yourself off from all the distractions and no matter how many productivity books you read no matter how many self-help books you read everybody i know that works a hectic life tries to be hyper productive is constantly distracted flitting from one thing to the next to the next and it's as if the corporate world is its own worst enemy isn't it because when i was working from home during um, the pandemic and still working a corporate job most of the senior leadership team never had any time to do any work because they were always call to call to call to call. So how are you going to get the best out of an individual if they never have any time to sit down and apply themselves to one task? And I think that's the real crux of what you explore within the book and the real solution that I'm hoping it will provide in the long term is helping people understand that spinning a million in one plates is only, is only useful if you can spin one plate at a time and give it your devoted, undivided attention to then go on to the next. Well, there's loads of things in what you just said, but I'm just thinking, how old are you, Fergus? Can I I'm 25. You? Right, so I'm just thinking about that. So since you've done your A-levels, it's about, what, seven years, six years? Eight, eight years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so even in those eight years, I think there's lots of things that have happened, but a lot of the factors 
So there are 12 facts. I learned from the incredible scientists I interviewed all over the world, from Moscow to Miami, from Rio to New Zealand, that, that there are 12 factors that, that uh, can boost or harm your attention, as I mentioned before. And um, I, think, I think there's there's lots you've got to, and I think there's, there's two levels at which we've got to understand this and respond to this. There's the ways we can understand it at the level of an isolated individual, right? There's all sorts of things we can do as individuals. And then there's things we have to do together collectively as groups to stop the things that are fucking up our attention, right? So it's like someone's pouring itching powder on us all the time. So I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a kind of example. I think really um, you, you've just described really well that the kind of science, uh, I'll give you an example of the science behind it. So at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I interviewed one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, a man named Professor Earl Miller. And he said to me, look, you've got to understand one crucial thing about the human brain. You can only think consciously about one thing at a time. And this is just a fundamental limit of the human brain. It's been there for 40,000 years in that way. Um, you know, the human brain hasn't changed in 40,000 years significantly. Um, it ain't going to change anytime soon. You have this limit. You can think about one thing at a time. But what's happened is we've begun to tell ourselves a story that we can actually do many, many things at the same time. So we've told ourselves, in fact, a guy called Larry Rosen, a professor, discovered the average young person believes they can follow seven forms of media at the same time. But what happens when you believe you're doing many things at the same time is actually, as Professor Miller explained and as his science has shown, you're actually juggling, you're switching very rapidly between things. And that comes with a series of really big costs. So the first is called the switch cost effect. So let's say, I'm talking to you now, Fergus, let's say my phone, I don't know where it is, it's somewhere behind me. Let's say I just glanced at my text messages, right? You might think, oh, I can do that. Two seconds, that'll take me two seconds to glance at my text messages and look back at you. But in the moment in which I do that, my brain has to refocus. Wait, what did Fergus just ask me? That takes a certain amount of mental power and energy, right? So that's the first cost in it, the first cost. The second cost is a, what's called a, what I would call a screw-up effect, which is where when I do that, I'm going to make a mistake, right? Let's say I'm doing my tax return and I check my text messages. I go back to my tax return. I'm going to make mistakes. And then I have to go back and correct those mistakes. That takes more time, more mental energy. The third is about your memory. So to translate your experiences into memories takes a certain amount of brain power, right? And if your brain power is instead jammed up with, what was just on Snapchat? What did that guy just say to me on WhatsApp? What's this guy on the TV saying? Oh, oh yeah, oh, do they want me on the Zoom now? Yeah, what's going there? Oh, I've just got an email. If it's jammed up like that all the time, the evidence shows the more distracted you are, the less you will remember, because you just don't have, your brain doesn't have the time to translate your experiences into memories. And the fourth way it, it really degrades your thinking is in terms of creativity. So when you have space to think, your brain will think back over things you've experienced, things people have said to you, things you've read, and it will start connecting them in interesting and original ways. That's what creativity is. But if you don't have the mental space to do that because you're switching, 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 your creativity will significantly go down. And those might sound like small effects. I was struck by how huge they are. So... To give you a couple of examples, Hewlett Packard, you know, the company that make printers, they did a small study where they got a group of workers and split them into two groups. And the first group was told, just, just do your work and you're not going to be distract, distracted or interrupted. And the second group was told, do your work. And then they interrupted them with emails and phone calls. So, you know, a, a slightly more than normal, but not some insane amount. And then they tested the IQ of both sets of workers. The workers who were being distracted scored 10, point, 10 IQ points worse on the test. To give you a sense of what that means, if you or me got stoned now, if we just, just smoked a fat spliff together, our IQ would go down by five points. So chronic distraction is twice as bad for your ability to be intelligent and think clearly as getting stoned. You'd be better off sitting at your desk, smoking a spliff and getting stoned, but not being distracted than sitting at your desk without a spliff being distracted all the time, right? There was another study at Carnegie Mellon University where they took 138 students and they split them into two groups and gave them an exam. And the first group did them under normal exam conditions and the second group was told, um, you can receive tech, you leave your phone on and you can receive text messages. And you'd think that would make it them do better because they could cheat, right? They could text people and ask them the answers. In fact, the people who 
uh, were distracted by text messages did 20% worse on the exam than the people who were not distracted, right? We're all losing about 20% of our bandwidth by just being constantly interrupted. So there's that, and that, so that's, an, that's a, both an individual and collective problem, but just to go back to think about collective solutions. So lots of people will hear this, right? And obviously they, you know, I think most people will intuitively know this chronic distraction is not good for us. But also there can be an element where people hear someone like me saying this and they think, you know, it's a bit like I've gone up to a homeless person in the street and said, you know what, mate, you know what would make you feel much better would be if you went to the Ritz over the road there and just had a really nice dinner. And the homeless person will go, yeah, you fucker, I, I know that. I can't do that, right? In a similar way, a lot of people will be hearing what I'm saying and a lot of the other things that we need to do to improve our attention and going, yeah, I can't do that, right? If I don't answer my, if I don't follow Slack, if I don't answer my boss, if I'm not on that Zoom, you know, I'll lose my job. And that's why I think we need to make all sorts of changes that make it possible for people to do the things they know will improve their attention. I'll just give you one very brief example. In France, in 2016, they had a big problem with what they called le burnout, which I don't think you need me to translate. And, um, and so the French government, under pressure from trade unions, set up um, a government investigation of it, led by Bruno Metling, who was the head of Orange, their biggest telecom company. And he discovered 35% of French workers felt they could never unplug. They had to have their phones on and not silenced all the time because their boss might contact them at any time of day or night and they would get, you know, you're, you'd be in trouble if you didn't respond. When I was a kid, the only people who were on call were doctors and the prime minister. Now, almost half the economy is on call, right? And it was really screwing people up. It meant they never rested. It meant they couldn't think clearly. Um, and so the French government introduced a law called the right to disconnect. It's very simple. It just means um, you have a legal right to defined work hours and you have a legal right that outside those work hours you don't have to check your email you don't have to check your text and you don't have to take work calls so i went to paris that's been introduced companies get fined rent a kill got fined seventy thousand euros because they were trying to get their staff to still respond to emails out of work hours right you can see how that frees people up to do the things they want to do because there's a real risk at the moment that telling people about these things makes them go Right, but I can't, I can do some of that, but it's really limited. We want to create social changes that can free people up to make the changes they want to make. It needs to begin institutionally, doesn't it? And then trickle down to society because social changes are only as good as the institutions in which they operate, especially when it comes to employment profession. And I mean, I, I would put it slightly differently because I don't think, so sometimes you'll get enlightened institutions who just figure this out and do the right thing. But most of the time... <clears throat> they'll do the right thing if their workers band together and pressure them, right? That there's the pressure that's got to be put on them. So um, I, in New Zealand, I went, occasionally you'll get an enlightened boss. In New Zealand, I went to this amazing company called Perpetual Guardian, where the boss moved the entire company from a five-day week to a four-day week on the same pay. Now, I was going to ask what was your opinion on the sub from the subject of knowledge on, on the four-day work week, because it is a hot topic, isn't it? Yeah, so I went, in, I went to New Zealand to see this, and it was fascinating that... Um, the company achieved more in four days than they did in five. And this has been, because they've seen this in loads of places. Um, Microsoft in Japan went to a four day week and their productivity went up 40%. Toyota in Gothenburg in Sweden went to a six hour day instead of an eight hour day on the same pay. And their mechanics actually fixed 115% more in, in six hours than they had in eight. And I remember, at first that seems counterintuitive, it feels weird. And I interviewed this guy called Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer who's at um, Stanford University and is a professor of organisational behaviour. And he said to me, look, it's not complicated. Ask any sports fan, do you want your team to go onto the pitch, exhausted, knackered, been playing, you know, 60 hours that week? No, you want them to go on feeling refreshed, relaxed, in the zone, right? Well, why do you think anyone else is different? <laughs> you know, um, so but but that's a good model. It's a good example. So in in New Zealand, where this happened, it was because an enlightened boss, Andrew Barnes, a wonderful guy, just decided to do it. But most of the time, it won't work that way. You think about the weekend, right? The we, you know, we now take the weekend. Well, for a long time, people took the weekend for granted. It's been invaded now by work hours. But um, for a hundred years, people had the weekend off. Why did that happen? It didn't happen because 
institutions decided to do it spontaneously. It happened because trade unions organized, workers organized. They fought, you know, I mean, the first strike for the weekend happened in 1787 in Philadelphia. They didn't get it till 1835. Police used to just beat the shit out of them when they organized for it. You know, the, the, so these are big collective fights. Um, now, of course, there are things we can do as individuals. And of course, there'll be some enlightened institutions who just do the right thing anyway. But to be honest, I think most of it, we're going to have to organize and fight for it. People are uh, very much switching on to it. Again, I think the pandemic, one of the blessings against many of the negatives of the pandemic is that it's forced people to really consider how they want to work, how they want to operate. And I'm firmly of the opinion that actually, in London especially, the worst model is the three days in, two days off, or vice versa, because it means that you need to be close enough to be commutable and far enough away to have the ability to have a, a functioning workspace. And if, you're, if you've got a family, then that's a very difficult predicament to be in financially. And that adds pressure, and that pressure is going to compromise the employee's ability to work effectively and... I think in tech, it's very much a it's very much an employee's market at the moment, whereby you know there's infinite jobs and people are wanting to work remotely because it allows them to manage their own time, allows them to manage the environment in which they work, and people are becoming more switched onto this. And I think um, the main barrier to this now, from well, in London to some degree, not the main barrier, one of the barriers is simple practical things like the fact that there are tenancy agreements that need to be justified by having workers in offices. There are work quotas that are in contracts that need to be met, and there's this pattern that needs to be broken, but it's only going to be broken by more people saying, you know what, no, actually, I have learned that I am more effective working five days a week from home, and I'll be in the office for key leadership meetings, and that's it. But I'm going to make sure that either side of that leadership meeting, I'm not working that day because it, it bounces out my workload, that sort of thing. But I think it's trust. Trust is the, the DNA that needs to run through all this, isn't it, from employee to employer that allows them to explore for themselves what makes them most productive but it's it's a difficult one to apply isn't it because th that trust is so individualized in terms of how, how do we get the best out of the individual when everyone is so different well i think one of the things we have to do is challenge a lot of the underlying ideas that are fucking up our attention so one of them um is uh, so the, the apple macintosh team used to have a slogan they would wear it on t-shirts saying working 90 hours and loving it we've got these um underlying ideas that actually and, and this is definitely in my head i feel this myself um we've internalized these ideas like a good worker is the worker who works themselves to the point of exhaustion right actually it's not a good worker that's a worker who's fucked up their ability to think and pay attention we wouldn't say a good worker is one who got drunk or stoned at their desk, right? But the, being exhausted is the equivalent of that. In fact, I did a lot of research, you know, we, uh, one of the big causes that are damaging our attention is our lack of sleep. We now sleep an hour less than we did in 1942, and I interviewed the leading experts on sleep in the world, and that is absolutely wrecking our ability to focus and pay attention. I interviewed a guy called Dr. Charles Seisler, who's one of the leading experts on sleep in the world at Harvard Medical School. He did this amazing study what they did is they basically they put together two forms of technology there's a technology that can track your eyes and what you're looking at and there's a technology that can track what's happening in your brain what they discovered is if you're tired and you don't have to be that tired if you've been awake for example for 19 hours which doesn't seem so long um you can be looking around you you appear to be awake but parts of your brain have literally gone to sleep you cannot you you cannot see the things you are looking at right now that is not an uncommon phenomenon um, so I think there's partly that. And also, I think there's an underlying thing as well about speed. So this is one of the things I learned about um, for the book that was really fascinating, is there is re there's really good evidence that the world has genuinely sped up. We talk faster than we did in the 1950s. We walk faster than we did in the 1950s. There has been a profound acceleration in how the world works. And this is a guy called Professor Suna Lehman at um, the Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen, who I went to interview, who's, who's proven this is reducing our ability to pay attention, right? You can only speed up so much before your attention starts to fragment and break down and your attention becomes much more superficial and it becomes harder and harder to think deeply. This is why um, this guy called Professor Guy Claxton at the University of Winchester who studied all sorts of practices that involve slowing down whether it's meditation, yoga, tai chi, 
all of them improve your attention. And the real reason, or one of the key reasons, it's just because you slow down, right? Slowing down, speed um, fragments your attention and slowness nurtures your attention. But we've got into this climate in relation to work and actually in relation to pretty much everything where, you know, the, the Google slogan is if you're not fast, you're fucked internally. And I think that's become like the culture, the, 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 the slogan for the culture, right? We become obsessed with speed. And I think what's one of the things that's interesting about COVID has obviously been a horrific tragedy for all the reasons your listeners don't need me to explain. But one thing we can take from it that's positive is for a lot of people, clearly not everyone like healthcare workers, but for a lot of people, COVID was a moment when we could slow down. And really, it was the first moment in more than 100 years when the world together decided to slow down and put something else above speed and growth and while we had to do it for terrible reasons and there's been a lot of stress and pain in all of that i do think there's something really valuable we can learn from that as well that the, the the speed at which we were moving is unsustainable and as professor layman has shown it really fucking trashes your attention um there's the studies of speed readers for example so you can there are professional speed readers but who have to read legal documents quickly or whatever but there are also just anyone you can train them to speed read right almost anyone can be trained to do it and you can learn to read faster than you currently do almost everyone can but it comes with the cost the more you speed up the less you understand the less you remember the less you retain right and in a way we've all been sort of speed reading life for a really long time and it's one of the factors that's profoundly degrading our attention and we need to look at both individual and systematic ways of slowing down. A four day week is a systematic way of slowing down. I would argue we should aim to be doing that for the whole economy. It'd be good for the economy, but even if it wasn't good for the economy, it would be good for all of us, right? We, we you know, um, yeah, anyway, it was a long answer, sorry. Question or I'd say conundrum for me, or no, I'm gonna start again actually, but final question from me is one that's obviously highly subjective and could potentially be criticised by parents for coming from the wrong place as neither of us are in a position to do so. But with all the knowledge that you have from what you've learned through Lost Connections, from what you've learned through Stolen Focus, in your opinion, what is the best way in younger people and children, in our children as a father to be in the future, I hope, what is the best way to cultivate a healthy mind in young people today? I know it's a big open-ended question, but it's, um, it's, it's one that will help underpin a healthier future for us all. Yeah, it's a lot, as you know, the last 20% or so of the book is about this, and this is really, I think this is hugely important. So in the last 30, 40 years, we've seen an absolutely profound transformation of childhood. And at the same time, we've seen a huge rise in children displaying attention problems. And I believe that is linked. Now, this is not the fault of any individual parent. It's been a really big cultural change. So I tell the story in the book of a woman called Lenore Skenazi. When Lenore, Lenore grew up in a suburb of Chicago, and when she was five years old, um, she used to go to school every morning by walking out the house on her own and walking to school, which was about 15 minutes away. When she got to the road outside the school, a 10 year old boy who was the lollipop man would walk the little kids across the street, right? And then school would end at three o'clock and Lenore would leave on her own like every other five year old child there. She would play with her friends in the streets for about two or three hours. They'd wander around, they'd go to the park and then they'd go home for dinner, right? Now, if you saw a five year old child on the street, you would call the police, right, on their own. In, in in that 30, so that period in the, the early 60s when the Noor's doing that, that is what every child pretty much in the world did, right? My parents did it, your parents probably did it. Children just wandered around freely, they played freely with other children, and then they went home. By the time Lenore had her own kids in the 90s, she was living in Queens in New York, um, childhood had entirely changed. Childhood took place almost entirely behind closed doors. Today, only 10% of children ever play outdoors without adult supervision. And the average amount they play is 15 minutes a week, right? So that we've gone from that being the absolute standard form of childhood for all children forever, to childhood now being highly managed, 
confined behind closed doors. And the single most important thing we can do um, this, for children's attention, their ability to think, their ability to be mentally healthy, is to let them play when they're children. Play, as Dr. Isabel Benke, who's associated with Oxford University, um, you should interview Isabel actually, she's an amazing person, one of the world's leading experts on play, as she explains, play is how we build the foundation of attention, the foundation of learning. When children play with each other, they learn all sorts of things. They learn how to make things happen, right? How to persuade other kids to play the game. They learn how to cope with disappointment. Maybe you lose sometimes, the other kids say you've lost, you've got to accept that, right? They learn how to be brave. They learn how to cope with anxiety. They learn how to learn. And what we've done is we've stripped free play out of children's lives. Now they either, either play on screens or they play in supervised ways where the adults impose the rules, explain the rules and enforce the rules, which is completely different to free play where you're figuring it all out for yourself. And this is one of several factors that's had a disastrous effect on children's ability to focus and pay attention. They're not learning the crucial skills that you learn through play. So Lenore set up an amazing group called Let Grow. You should go to letgrow.org to check it out, which is about getting groups of parents to let their children play outdoors again. Um, and it has profound and transformative effects. I went to with Lenore to Long Island, to a school that had done this. And it was like seeing children come back to life. These kids would describe how they'd climbed a rope, they'd climbed a tree, they'd, they were so excited. There was a 14-year-old boy, and this was a fancy part of Long Island. There was a 14-year-old boy, big, strong 14-year-old boy, who told me that his parents n had never let him go out on his own because, the phrase he used was, because of all these kidnappings. There had never been any kidnappings of 14-year-old boys in Long Island, right? I mean, he, he was living in a town where the olive oil shop is across the street from the French bakery, and he had a level of fear that would be appropriate to if he was living in Colombia at the height of Pablo Escobar's terror, right? It was deranged. Um, and then this program began, and all the parents in this area were persuaded to let their children play outside again. And it was so fascinating. At first, they just let him run around the block, and even that was revelatory to him. And of course exercise is very good for attention and thinking as well but then gradually him and his friends start doing things in the end they went into the woods and built a fort and just seeing these kids talk about it discovering they could make things happen that learning skills with each with other kids where they where they negotiated the boundaries themselves it was so moving and I remember Lenore saying you know think about that in relation to human history for for all of human history kids go out they explore they build things and then we stopped them and then that boy, given the opportunity to go out, what does he do? He immediately goes and builds a fort in the woods with his friends, right? There's something deep and primal. Human children want to explore their environment. But what we've done, as one expert put it, we've told them, we've mapped the environment for you. Don't explore it. But that is not what childhood is. You, to be a healthy, functioning adult, you need to have had you need to have increasing sense of competence throughout your childhood, an increasing sense of freedom. Um, and, and I think actually COVID again is a good chance for us to think about this because we've seen what happens to our children. You know, they've had to be imprisoned and detained even more than they normally are. And we can see it's had this horrible effect on them. It's terrible. What we need to do is restore psychological and physical freedom to children. And there are all sorts of ways we can do that. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of other things going on. We could talk about the school system. We could talk about the way children, the food children eat, which has a disastrous effect on their attentions. All sorts of things I go through in the book. Talk about the pollution they're exposed to, which profoundly harms their brains. Um, but for me, the single most important one is about restoring play. We've got to restore free, open play. That is the heart of childhood. Without that, um, it's much harder for children to develop attention, focus, and just happiness the final 20 percent of the book as you said it gave me a uh, a lot more faith in the in the future from a guidance point of view because one of my fears is it, it probably goes back to the deep-rooted masculine fear of falling short of what i hope to achieve but the, the fear of failing to bring up a child a hypothetical child in the future that would feel the way that i did so what can i do to mitigate that from a young age to cultivate a healthier mind in an even more polluted world so 
for anyone that needs further answers on that, the final 20% of the book goes into it in a lot of detail, covering those points that you just mentioned there. But thank you very much for that. What are the key details? Are we still in focus coming very soon? Oh, um, so I meant to read a little blurb from my publicist, but I can't. I can't do that. Um, <laughs> it makes me sound like a dick. Um, so anyone who wants any more information about the book can go to stolenfocusbook.com where you can get it as an audio book, an ebook, and obviously a physical book that will be in any bookshop near you. Or you can order it online. Uh, nicer to order it from the bookshop because they're nice and pay their taxes. Um, uh, you can also, on the book's website, stolenfocusbook.com, you can uh, listen for free to audio with lots of the experts that we've talked about and other people. Uh, and you can find out uh, what, this is the bit I'm meant to read out, which I can't I find it all, but you can find out what Stephen Fry, Hillary Clinton, Naomi Klein, Emma Thompson, Ronkin Chatterjee, and many other people have said about the book. Um, sorry, I, like I, I got in trouble at the end of a podcast once because um, it was an American podcast. And at the end, they said, what's your Facebook? And I said it. And they said, what's your Twitter? And I said it. And they said, um, what's your Instagram? And I said it. And they said, what's your Snapchat? And I said, I am a 42-year-old man, right? The only 42-year-old men on Snapchat are definitely paedophiles. Right? Like, why would they be on it otherwise? And the, the kind of host went a bit quiet. And later I found out that he, um, he in fact, is on Snapchat and is an adult man. And I didn't mean to accuse him of being a paedophile. But uh, it was very unfortunate. I was a bit like, what the fuck are you doing, right? Like, for goodness sake, you know. Uh, but I also feel like, you know that American TV show to catch a predator where they uh, catch paedophiles by pretending to be children online? I feel like the next season of To Catch a Predator, they should just go up to adult men in the street and say, what is your Snapchat handle? And if they have an answer that's anything other than no, just immediately arrest them, right? Throw them in the van, obviously a pedo. The turnover uh, time would be a uh, you get you'd get a lot more in one episode, wouldn't you? You'd get exactly. you'd get one Reasoning. big narrative to sixty and sixty <laughs> minutes. It's uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, exactly. I'm not going to ask you what your Snapchat is, but your uh, your Facebook, your Instagram, and you've already given the book website, but Facebook and Instagram are. Oh God, uh, I don't know. I link to from the I'll put them in. I'll put them in the show notes. I feel like a real hypocritical twat if I, you know, a lot of the book is against social media, and it would be ridiculous if I was then on social media all the time, which I'm not. But um, so yeah, Fergus, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so much, and you should be really proud of what you've achieved and the work you're doing. And I'm really grateful to, to have talked with you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And uh, as I said, you've been a pivotal part of my own journey. So I can't thank you enough for for coming on, and taking the time.